save for pesticides. And everyone is scrambling now at the federal level to get their pesticides registered as safe for pesticides. And in that context, we really have to define, again, effect on children, carcinogenicity, reproductive effects, immune, neurological. What does safer mean? Is it safer if it doesn't cause cancer, but it causes immune system effects? Is it safer if it contaminates groundwater, but doesn't cause all these health effects? We've got, we need a definition of safer that is meaningful. And we've submitted in our comments that the only definition of safer really is biological, in the end, as a national goal. Moving down the continuum, or up the continuum, we need to look at the, a change in pest management practices. If we're talking about a strategy that replaces chlorpyrifos with synthetic pyrethroids, we're really not talking about meeting the goal that we're looking at. There are, there are at least five elements to an IPM strategy, which includes consumer education, it includes choice of materials, it includes exclusion practices, maintenance practices, it includes choice of materials. And we need to evaluate each one of these factors when we go out uh, and we talk about what changes in management practices really are. We've constructed some slides to show you, just to give you a thumbnail sketch, of how you make this evaluation. For instance, <clears throat> if we're talking about turf management, on the on the what we call the prevention-oriented system. That is, the goal of the system I'm talking about is to prevent pests, to prevent infestation. And on that side, we're calling it a prevention-oriented strategy. What, what it means is that you put in place a series of, you ask yourself a series of questions and get um, a series of answers. For instance, in this, in this category, we're looking at grass varieties and what is what are viable grass varieties in the conditions in which we're planting them local conditions you know what are the seed varieties that are indigenous to that area if I'm out in the Midwest or Colorado I'm looking at buffalo grass um, if I'm here someone can tell me what I'm looking at I don't know okay. whatever the indigenous grass species is it may be inappropriate to have Kentucky bluegrass uh, growing in Louisiana. It may not be, but that evaluation has to be made. And if you're bringing in a vulnerable species at the outset, you're doomed to failure. If you're building a house that's prone to termites, you're doomed to failure. You've got to prevent infestation to the extent you can at the outset. Mixing species in terms of the lawn is important. Now, you, you juxtapose that with a, 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 a treatment-oriented system. And the treatment-oriented system is doomed to failure because it's a monocultural system. And the varieties chosen do not minimize um, infestation. You're looking at, at things that might not readily appear to be pest management. And that's where the pest control industry, some of my friends in the pest control industry, have failed us. Because they look at pest management and they're not looking at the conditions that give rise to the pest often. So in a lawn, you've got to look at the soil. Is it healthy? Does it have high organic matter? Is the proper pH and fertility? Um, and, and you look at the way it's mowed. Is the mowing height correct? Is the watering correct? Those are in the prevention-oriented system. On the treatment-oriented side, we're, we're, dose, we're basically not looking at soil tilt. We're using high synthetic inputs we're using low organic matter. We don't care or look at the pH. And there's improper mowing height and proper water. So again, you're doomed to need that pesticide fix, OK? And then finally, monitoring. You know, monitoring is useful in that it doesn't, it doesn't really, um, it tells us ahead of time what's going on. And most of these systems don't look at monitoring. That was one of the biggest failures we've seen in our study. Now, agriculture, we can look at this similarly. Um, and what, I, what I'd like to actually is a, there's a um, there's a guy uh, some of you may know spoke at our conference two years ago. His name is uh, Ellie Coleman, uh, author of many books. He wrote an article, or his, the name of his speech was "Plant Positive: A New Approach to Pests," <laughs> and it was really really interesting because I think he put out a concept that is really central uh, to what we're what we're talking about in this whole area. He said, and this, this is the kind of mindset we need to think about when we're talking about changing pest management practices because of all our concerns. 
Our current pest control thinking is 180 degrees backwards. We should focus on enhancing the insusceptibility of plants rather than focus on killing pests. This approach can be defined as plant positive in contrast to the present approach, which is pest negative. So it's the same thing in agriculture as it is in the urban environment. Are we going to be pest negative when we see cockroaches in our house, or are we going to be house positive? I mean, it, really, the question is, what are we doing around our homes or in our school buildings that enable us to be building positive exclusion techniques, maintenance techniques in those buildings? Now, the typical pest control operator is not prepared to do this. He might think it's funny. He might think it's stupid. But there's a whole new school of operators, and there's a whole part of the National Pest Control Association that doesn't believe this is funny or stupid. Believes it's very important. Um, they still refer to it as IPM, and their definitions are limited in that regard. But they realize this is a very important approach, including the gentleman who runs the, the IPM program for the federal government in the capital area, who's responsible for 4 million square feet of building space and has eliminated 90% of the pesticides that they, that they used to use in those buildings. Insects and disease in agriculture should be seen as indicators, symptoms of stressed suboptimal plant growth rather than as enemies to be destroyed. The obvious solution is to focus on correcting the growing conditions, the cause, in order to optimize the, the psychological well, or the physiological well-being, probably the psychological too, of the plant. Insects and disease bring a, a message when plants are under stress. Since it is a message we haven't understood, we have tried to kill the messenger. If we pay attention to the message, we will focus on preventing pest management or pest damage by providing the proper cultural conditions for unstressed plant growth. And this is exactly what they've done in the state of Iowa by, with elimination of herbicides that have competitive yields, in fact, better yields than the herbicide-dependent systems. They do that by altering their pest, their growing practices. They have a system there called ridge till, and ridge, which is not coming up here, and ridge till is a system that enables you to plant the corn at the top of the ridge, and in the, in the depression, you plant a cover crop which shades out the weeds. Weeds are only bad because they're competition for your cash. They're taking away money that you've invested in your farm, this crop. And if the weeds grow higher than the crop, you're not going to get your crop. So you, you give the crop a head start, you plant, you plant a cover crop in the depression, not only are you shading out the weeds with that herbicide, you're fixing nit nitrogen, which is fertilization, natural fertilization for the plant. This is a systemic or a systematic approach. It's an approach that has to be applied not only in agriculture, but in every pest management situation we're dealing with. This is where we're at right now. We, we, the, the right to know movement in this country has achieved a lot for us. We, we've gotten more information. This is a sign that's, that's required in many states uh, across the country that says caution, keep off. Uh, this area has been sprayed. But the reality is these signs are not enough. This is not what we're talking about in terms of changing our pest management practices. And in fact, some states like the state of Florida have adopted a pesticide registry and have required that people be notified when pesticide spraying is going on. The state of Florida enhanced its law by then adopting an extra sensitive uh, distance notification for people that are extra sensitive to pesticides. That's a funny expression, sensitive, because what we're really talking about is our poisoning symptoms. There is no inherent disability associated with an individual who is poisoned by a toxic chemical. But for better or worse, those who are chemically sensitive have this extra area it's like a, I think, I forget, about a half mile or, or a mile radius around their home in which they are given pre-notification. That has been challenged by the Florida Pest Control Association. But what I'm saying is, right to know doesn't necessarily give us the level of protection that we need, given the exposure scenario that we, we saw, we talked about before, in terms of pesticide drift and in terms of volatilization and movement of pesticides off the site. I'm not saying this is bad. This is a step on the continuum. Right to know is an important element on the continuum uh, to getting to our goal. Informed decision making is critical. But once this sign goes up, it does not ensure us that our homes are safe 
and that we will not suffer involuntary exposure. Another thing to remember in this area is that pesticides move into buildings from off of sites. One of the things EPA found in its study, a preliminary study actually down in uh, North Carolina Research Triangle Park, was that in their finding of pesticides indoor, inside homes, they found many pesticides that, that are not registered and applied indoors. So clearly what's, being ha what's happening is they're getting in through windows. These are outside chemicals not registered for use indoors. They're being tracked in uh, from the outside when people move in and out of the home. The other element to all of this, there, you know, there are a lot of reasons to do what we do. I mean, clearly there's a self-interest in protecting our children. There's also increasing concern about what we're doing to the environment. Someone living in New York City, for instance, who goes down to the local hardware store to buy some raid, should not only be concerned about what he or she's doing in terms of his or her home environment, but should be concerned about what's going on in the production facility in Louisiana that produced that product. We need to start looking at the cradle to grave, and we need to link the manufacturing community, those workers in those plants, up with the pesticide reform movement that is concerned about the use of chemicals that cause harm. And clearly, the, the concept of green consumerism, not buying products that are damaging to the environment, either in the community of use or in the community of production, is a concept that is meeting with increased enthusiasm, I think, uh, throughout, the, throughout the US. I mean, you can see the success of Rainforest Action Alliance and Network that Clearly people understand we live in a global environment and that we have to deal with these problems in a more global way. Which gets us back to what are we going to do about all this? Well, this is me uh, at, a, at a rally in, at, on Capitol Hill again in which we said we should have no cancer causing pesticides in our food. And we, gave, we brought some examples of food that had been grown without pesticides. And we, we're segueing here from the whole issue of what we can do around our home to the implication of policy and the intrusion that policy has on our lives. And our message that day in front of the Capitol was save the Delaney Clause, which I'd like to spend a moment on, because I think it, it shows the interconnectedness of our world, of our decisions, the implications of involuntary exposure, the meaningfulness of pesticides uh, on, in our lives. Things that we can't readily control on a day-to-day -day basis that we really want to. Delaney was a congressman from New York, James Delaney. In 1953, he was able to pass something called the Delaney Clause, Section 409 of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. The editor of our newsletter tells me that you are all totally bored now and your eyes are glazed over because I'm talking about policy. But I hope you're not, because I, I for one, having sitting on and working with communities across this country, believe very strongly, after listening to victims day in and day out, that if we don't start to think and talk and feel comfortable with policy discussions, if we leave those discussions to somebody else in the industry, lobbyists with special interests, commodity groups, pesticide trade groups, if we leave it to groups like the National Agricultural Chemicals Association, which just changed its name to the American Crop Protection Association, we will see that our views will be distorted and unrepresented. So please bear with me as your eyes glaze over when I talk about policy. James Delaney is my hero because he adopted, I think, the only decent law that's on the books today. It said, if you find out that a chemical is a carcinogen, you prohibit it from introduction into processed food. The only thing that's wrong with James Delaney is he was a congressman, and so he had a compromise. And he compromised by focusing his amendment on processed food as opposed to raw or fresh food. It's a problem, but it doesn't take away from the fact that there's a concept here. The concept is you identify something bad, and you get rid of it. 
The concept is you establish a national goal to say that certain levels of harm are inappropriate, and you get rid of it. And that's the clause that is under attack on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. It's under attack because EPA has identified 35 chemicals that they believe, 35 carcinogens, 36, I'm sorry, that they believe would fall under the Delaney Clause. You may have read about this in your newspaper last week because of a settlement that the Natural Resources Defense Council reached with uh, EPA on beginning to enforce, yes, you heard me right, beginning to enforce a 1958 law that was never fully enforced. I say fully because it did apply to new chemicals, but not the old new chemicals. This is a concept, in my view, that is absolutely essential to preserve. It's a concept that we need to integrate into our thinking at the community level. You identify a carcinogen, and you get it out of the community. You identify a carcinogen, you get it out of our food supply. The flip side of all of this is called risk assessment, or something called negligible risk. It's sort of like the American Crop Protection Association. We believe in affordable, economical, and negligible risk food. Well, the reality is, how you calculate negligible risk goes back to risk assessment. And if any of you can repeat the two things I mentioned earlier that I want you to walk away from this meeting with, and that is, pesticides are inadequately tested, not fully tested for the full range of adverse effects that we're concerned about. And secondly, that the chemicals are subject to a risk and benefit standard. When EPA looks at the risk assessment, and if Delaney moves from get the chemical out toward come up with an acceptable level of risk so that you can use this chemical, the system breaks apart. The system breaks apart because we're not looking at multiple exposures. We're not looking at the fact that 11 carcinogens are registered for use on apples, 10 on grapes. We're not looking at the fact that 2,4-D is registered on our lawn, it's registered on our food. We're not looking at the interplay between dietary and non-dietary exposure. We're not looking at vulnerable population groups, the fact that chemicals have different effects on developing organ systems that children don't have the ability to detoxify to the extent that we, that adults do. That the proportion of carcinogen to average body weight in a child is greater than in the adult. We don't look at these things. We don't have good exposure data. We don't have good data on what different ethnic groups eat in terms of their exposure, occupation groups. We can't really do risk assessment. And the, uh, if you talk to a risk assessor about what risk assessment is, they'll say, well, it's sort of a policy tool that enables us to make judgments. The president of the American Chemical Society said risk assessment requires inferences drawn from limited scientific data. And that's the risk assessor. But the policymaker comes up and stands up before the TV cameras and says, the risk of this chemical is negligible and probably about one in a million chance of getting cancer. And that is the biggest and most deceptive statement that I think we see today. The problem is, it's being sold to Congress very effectively. There are over 220 sponsors, including the Louisiana delegation and the U.S. House of Representatives, that is getting, am I getting a note here? That is ready to pass a bill that will ban, that, I'm sorry, that will repeal repeal the Delaney Clause. 220 members in the last session of Congress, thank God they went home, signed on a bill that would repeal the Delaney Clause outright and replace it with a negligible risk standard. Our voice is not being heard. And we need the clarity coming out of Louisiana, out of your community. We need the clarity um, being voiced across the board. Now, clearly, saving the Delaney Clause is it is something we can do, we can write letters, we can engage in debate at, our community, uh, at the community level, we can, in our religious institutions, in our school boards, PTAs, we can get the kind of support we need because overwhelmingly when people are polled, they don't want this. They simply don't want this and it's really a question of getting people activated to get involved. So in closing, because Mary, I could talk all day, and Mary Lou knows that, so she had to give me a note to get this stuff. Um, 
Right, and people want to ask questions. So, in closing, I'll tell you what our slogan is, our new slogan that we're going to carry the banner, and we hope you can carry this banner. In fact, I've got a t-shirt that shows you the banner. It's called, Freedom from Pesticides is Everybody's Right. We also have a bumper sticker, and I brought some with me if anyone wants it. Freedom from Pesticides is Everybody's Right. And it is a right. It's a health right. It's a property right. It's an economic right. It's a right for our children. It's a right for our future. It's an environmental protection right. And we can embrace that theme, and we need to embrace that theme at the community level, where we're working on programs to get pesticides out of the schools, office buildings, rights of ways, recreation areas, and we can embrace that in our policy work as we try to ensure that the government represents us and not the special interest groups. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you.
you represent us. So both has to happen. Yes. It's, it's a very, the law is a very difficult area. I would say, I mean, take Ventilane, for instance. You know, we're working with growers on legal action in numerous states from Florida, Puerto Rico to Hawaii. I just got a call yesterday from Australia. Very difficult, very difficult. The proof issue is extremely difficult. You know, when you have growers that have used a number of chemicals, when you as an individual are exposed to a number of chemicals, how do you prove it's that one? That, harm, that harmed you. Um, these are very difficult cases, and, and usually they're very expensive, and the remedy to date has not been as great as we'd like it to be. There are a lot of creative lawyers out there, and I, I encourage them every day they call me to go after applicators and to go after chemical companies that knowingly spray in areas where people are exposed that get harmed, that are harmed. Um, and again, I don't mean to disagree with the bottom-up approach and changing behaviors and patterns of pra practices at the local level. I think that's a great. It has to be a, a multi-part approach. Exactly. Yes. Uh, since he mentioned the uh, Daltons, would you comment on what the implications are of Congress passes the general rule on tax and trades for pesticide law? <laughs> Well, you know, the, as you know, having watched the NAFTA debate, we're moving from the North American Free Trade Agreement to the General Tr Agreement on Tariffs and Trades, which is an international agreement. And what is being sought is uh, alignment or harmonization, they call it, with the International Codex Standards, which are basically established by industry uh, internationally and, and utilized in Europe. And these standards would literally take away protections that we in this country have established. Uh, in most cases, they would bring down the level of protection. There's a great move on the part of industry, multinational corporations, to protect themselves through harmonization by allowing for, the, for goods to be transported, transferred across borders uh, more easily than they are now. And overall, GATT, as we see it, would lower the protections if the, gov if the federal government in this country and Congress uh, actually ceded to that international view. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jay. Uh, I know folks may have a lot more questions, uh, but we do have a, a time problem and, and uh, some logistics here. Pat, you want to do this or I can do whatever. <laughs> what we have now is we're going to do two sessions. Introduce yourself. Oh, I'm Pat. I'm on. Works at the lean off. Um, if I can have this half of the room to stay put, basically, what they're going to do is they're going to come in and put the divider up. After the break, come back. Yeah, after the break. In this half of the room, go to the Ottoman room. It's all the way down to the bar. You make a left. Willie and Juan will be guiding you there. We'll be down. We'll be Everyone's going to see the same speakers. We're just, instead of moving people around, we're moving the speakers around. And it's only because of the room situation. So, is there any questions about that? Okay, well, in around 10 minutes, 10 minutes, we'll start again. So, this half of the room will be in the audit room in 10 minutes, and this half will be back. That'd be great.
separate concrete
I'll be uh, counseling these on priorities. Um, can you hear me in the back? No, I'll speak louder. No? This is my very first time talking in this sort of venue, so I have to bear with me. I hope this is the beginning of a long speaking career, but anyhow. Um, my position at the Council on Economic Priorities involves um, coordinating a program called the Campaign for Clean Appropriations. It lists uh, America's worst polluting companies. Um, some of you may be either happy or quite uh, saddened to know that many of these companies are uh, active right here in the Mississippi Delta area. Um, now let me talk a little bit first about the uh, Council. The Council on Economic Priorities has been around for 25, going on 26 years. Um, our founder and executive director, Alice Tepper Marlin, is uh, credited with having the, the um, I guess, founder and uh, initiator of the uh, social responsibility uh, movement dealing with corporations. Um, she and some of her uh, cohorts had the idea early on that um, while investors were often interested in looking at companies from a perspective of uh, performance, uh, competitiveness, and uh, profitability, that starting back in the Vietnam era, investors were interested in looking at uh, different criteria for um, um, corporate investment. Uh, and so the first um, move was in, in her, on her part was looking at companies as far as their role in Vietnam. She quickly moved on and uh, the CEP was founded looking at um, in the area of the environment. We started with uh, public paper companies, certainly one of the areas where um, I think people first became aware that corporations were finding themselves uh, to be polluting. Uh, dioxin was a topic that came to the forefront of some of our earlier studies and is still something that we're quite concerned with today. Um, the project that I'm involved in, C3, grew out of, uh, I guess it was sort of a natural outgrowth of a, another project called the Corporate Environmental Data Clearinghouse. That project publishes reports such as these. There's some samples on display on the other side there. Um, and what we've attempted to do is working both with companies and alternative sources. Uh, it's compiled a very comprehensive and objective database from which we publish these company reports. Um, part of the, well the CDBC focuses strictly on the area of environment, health and safety. We also have another um, component to CEP, which is called Screen, which is an uh, investor responsibility um, screening uh, service, and it looks at companies from many different uh, criteria, including uh, uh, social issues, uh, community involvement, that kind of thing. In my experience working with C3, um, and I guess at this point, I think it'd be better if I just sort of talk candidly because I'm not exactly sure where it's going, but in my experience with C3, we um, list the companies, we put them in front of a panel of independent judges, some of whom are here at the conference today, Audrey Evans from the Twilight Environmental Law Clinic and Paul Templer, who is also speaking um, later this afternoon. The judges, um, many of whom are specialists in uh, various areas pertinent to um, environment and corporate responsibility, look at the worst companies, the companies that we suggest um, we feel are the worst in their industry. Uh, we have over 150 companies so far that we've published reports on and more coming out, so we have a fairly wide um, base from which to choose the worst by industry. And uh, they're judged on quite a number of environmental criteria. Um, certainly toxic releases, and toxic releases per uh, sales, as normalizer sales are one of the major areas that we look at. Um, 
but we try to examine the whole spectrum of, um, of issues and policies. And many of these companies are, once they're listed, are invited to come to meet with us. Um, our experience is showing that companies are taking this much more seriously. They're sending generally high-level delegations to meet with us and um, disclose information and certainly make a lot of promises. Um, this brings me to a topic that I wanted to address. Uh, while I certainly feel that this campaign by targeting American first blue companies puts a lot of pressure on these um, corporations to change, and it also puts them in the public eye a lot of which I think it very much more seriously that this process often involves discussions of things like internal management structure changes, um, horizontal um, environmental internal accountability, um, five or ten year plans, um, research being conducted, and often is quite technical in its scope. And I think at the same as while this is very valid, it was something that Jay um, Ellen was mentioning that and someone brought up in the audience there as well. It's very important that people um, on the grassroots be involved and understand not only the issues but that they as consumers can also vote with their dollars. Um, for against these companies. Um, one of the major funders of the CDC is um, the McKnight Foundation. They have a Mississippi River project. It's something that Audrey's working uh, to see some funding with as well. And one of their um, main goals is to have us develop research that goes into these reports, for instance. Um, uh, and have that research available as a tool by which grassroots organizations and people in the community can um, benefit and use to, um, you know, propel uh, their causes and certainly to, uh, you know, have some ammunition to use against these tough corporations. So, on that note, if anyone has any questions about C3 or um, feels that I can, or CEP can be of any assistance to your concerns. Please let me know. Thanks. Thank you. Eric. <laughs> Tag Eric throughout the day as you see him walking around as a tall guy. Uh, our next speaker is going to be Mark Dorfman. Mark Dorfman's with Inform of New York, and he's working on a program called Risk Assistant. Mr. Mark Dorfman. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. <laughs> It's really a uh, pleasure to be here. I've been working with Lean now on and off for about four years. And it just amazes me how Marilee keeps getting younger and I keep getting older. <laughs> um, Inform has been around for about 20 years. Uh, we're a nonprofit uh, environmental research and education organization located in, in New York City. We just moved our offices to Wall Street with all the other nonprofit organizations. Um, <laughs> And uh, we specialize in, in case study research, uh, researching businesses, looking at just how far they're going with pollution prevention, what kind of programs, what kind of practices that they've uh, put into place. And we've published those uh, reports. And I have a booth, actually, or a table, um, right across from the registration desk. Uh, so you can come and see the materials or, or, or talk to me throughout the day. Uh, basically, what we found looking at the chemical industry in particular is that there's an enormous potential for pollution prevention to really have an effect on increasing competitiveness and decreasing the amount of waste that's generated. But we're also finding that pollution prevention really isn't being used, I'm sure not to your surprise, uh, by most businesses. And if you look at the releases of toxic chemicals reported to the Toxics Release Inventory in Louisiana, not only are you number one two years in a row, but the releases are actually going up. Uh, so there really needs to be more of a push for pollution prevention. It's not really happening on the legislative side uh, at, at this state or in this state. So one thing that Inform uh, 
uh, is down here doing also with a grant from the McKnight Foundation, is to work with communities, uh, and McKnight limits it to those along the Mississippi River between New Orleans and Baton Rouge, that are interested in entering into a constructive dialogue around pollution prevention with local plant officials. That is one way, uh, and it's, it's still an experimental type of procedure, this direct dialogue around pollution prevention, but various groups around the country are taking tacks on it, the good neighbor agreement, that sort of thing. Uh, but the uh, degree to which it's been done, it does show some promise. As many of you know who do try to uh, enter into dialogue over environmental issues with plant officials, it's often contentious and adversarial. But everyone agrees that pollution prevention is a good thing. So it seems like it's a good uh, topic in which to begin to have a constructive dialogue with plant officials. And not only will there be a greater understanding of pollution prevention progress made so far, uh, but once that constructive foundation is made, then other areas that can be you know, more contentious uh, will have a more constructive foundation from which to uh, lead a discussion between the community and the plants. Um, so that, that's one reason I'm down in uh, Louisiana for this week. Uh, and I've al already worked with Audrey Evans and Dan Nicolai and Ramona Stevens in identifying groups that might be interested in doing this. Uh, if any of you who haven't been contacted by any of those three might be interested or just want to know more, please come see me uh, throughout the day at the booth. The other thing that I'll be doing at that booth is uh, showing a personal computer software called Risk Assistant. Uh, Risk Assistant was developed by a group called Hampshire Research Institute in Washington, D.C. It was originally developed for EPA for use in Superfund sites. Uh, but Hampshire uh, wanted to get this tool out to communities or anybody who was interested in using it. And all you need is an IBM compatible computer. Uh, um, if you want other details, I can give them to you later. But there are basically three things that this database can do. Uh, first of all, it can act just like a database. Uh, for certain chemicals, it can give you some toxicity information. Uh, so properties about those chemicals that may affect uh, its toxicity, its solubility, um, etc., cetera. Um, and regulatory standards, both federal, state, and even European standards uh, that have been set in relation to that chemical. The other thing it, it does, it, it's an intelligent analytical program, uh, which means that it takes input data, uh, such as certain chemicals and the degree uh, of its concentration in local air, in surface water, in groundwater, in soil, in, in food, where, where, wherever data might exist, takes that data, takes information about the people who might be exposed, uh, their ages, um, whether they spend more time at home, whether they, their, their work is outdoors, so various kinds of information and tries to come up with an uh, exposure um, scenario. It then takes that exposure scenario and together with the toxicological information that's there in the databases, tries to come up with a risk character characterization. Uh, now as Jay said, there are certainly limits to risk assessment, but risk assessment is being used. And this is a tool to allow you to do your own risk assessment and just understand what goes into it, what its limitations are, what its assumptions are. Uh, and a, a local facility or local government is also doing risk assessment and giving you information. You now have something that uh, you can do yourself, compare, contrast, prioritize, that sort of thing. Uh, Lean has a copy of the software, um, and I believe that for uh, community organizations and nonprofits, it's only about $20, and that includes uh, free technical assistance, although it's a phone call to Washington, D.C. Uh, not through Inform, but through Hampshire Research, the ones who actually develop that software. Um, so that, that's pretty much what I wanted to share with you. Uh, so, you know, come by, you can play with the computer and uh, ask me any questions you have. Thanks, Mark. Our next speaker.
here is going to be Bill Redding. He's with the Mississippi River Basin Alliance, the Sierra Club. Uh, I can probably go around for half an hour saying I love these ways. Right. But uh, Bill's here to talk about the Mississippi River. Bill Redding. Good morning. Uh, I'll try not to digress, but and listening to Mark, uh, I must say something. I believe what's been a large problem with everything that we're doing from grassroots level is that someone in D.C. or New York is designing it for us instead of us being the one who are the driving forces behind it. Now, risk assessment is okay, risk assessment is okay, but if it doesn't come from the community, it's in trouble to begin with. Uh, I work on the Mississippi River. Eco region. Sierra Club in the last five years has identified in the country 21 eco regions and watershed approach to environmental degradation with three things taken into account, three important things the ecology, the historical aspect, and the cultural aspect. Because people live where they live because, be they European or the original people here, or people who are brought here against their will, because it is, for the most part, good places to live. Now, in the beginning, it was about water, and when it ends, it's going to be about water. And our stewardship of water. Takings and unfunded mandates have been a very big thing in this Congress just passed. But is it a takings if people in parts of Louisiana don't have safe drinking water or clean water or health problems. Why is it always the onus is on us to prove that something's not happening to us? If we have regulations and statutes, why aren't we insisting that they be adhered to? Three years ago, uh, the first project with the Eco Region Program that I, I am the director of for the Club of the Midwest, we say, is this feasible to have a Mississippi River Basin Alliance? And we sent out letters to 300 groups, national and local groups. Mary Lee was one of the persons, Susie Wilkins, who is now the coordinator of the alliance, or people that we talk to, indigenous people, Network. Is it feasible for us to see if we can come together and coalesce and come to some discord as far as what direction do we want to see the basin go? And I'm happy to say uh, three years hence today, the Mississippi River Basin Alliance is an independent organization with 60 organizations of which Mary Lee is the uh, president of the Mississippi River Basin Alliance, and Willie is one of the officers, as well as Florence is one of the alternate officers. This is an organization that's made up of uh, organizations from Mid-South, uh, Peace and Justice, Lean to the Garden Clubs of America, Indigenous Peoples, Environmental Network, etc. But one thing that's very important, you bring this diverse group of people and interests together to assure that the community is in control. So the structure that we have put in place is one that 60-40. At no time on the executive steering committee will there be more than 40% from national environmental organizations represented. Because representation will be from community organizations. And that goes for what the agenda will be and how the process of getting on the executive committee becoming a member of the alliance, etc. So this can remain a community-driven organization with the focus is where people live. I, for one, am not going to bash the people within the Beltway. They have a very important part to play here, but they need some instructions. They need some instructions coming back from Louisiana, Missouri, the Upper Mississippi, the Lower Mississippi, etc as to what needs to be done. And it needs to be a very progressive, progressive message. And yet, again, not so encompassing that it's not understood by the least sophisticated among us. 
play these games where some beautiful figures. I know scientists. I was through with science in the 10th grade with Nancy Hubbard, seeing to my hair with a bunch of burn. I was out of there to never return. But I must say that it's becoming increasingly uh, uh, helpful to work with people in the agencies, like Fish and Wildlife, some of the biologists there, to help write things that are readily understandable. And just as Shay said, we're all endangered species. And it's foolish in any conservation agenda to try to cut it in half and say toxicity year or what. If we're living beings in this and entities in the system, toxicity is going to affect us all in a negative way. Because water, water is the substance of our survival. But then we have a tendency to want to ghettoize toxins, that it belongs to that group of people over there. We do a classism on it, then we do a, a little uh, racism on it also. And gender comes in here also. Cultural lifestyle. So if we say something like environmental justice, are we really talking environmental justice from a conceptual point of view, or are we really talking about racism and injustice? Because injustice is the underlying cause here. And there's no provisions in the Constitution to prove it. No, it doesn't say the property rights, no. Show your property rights on water, that's a big issue that's going to be uh, really debated back and forth. Is it right that we don't have money for the grants that would have been provided for the Clean Water Act to help some of the little communities in Louisiana bring, upgrade their drinking water system. When, are you familiar with cryptosporidium? This is the uh, virus uh, that killed uh, 104 people in the Milwaukee area and poisoned a number of people. Last year, I happened to be over at Marquette University talking about water when this broke out, over there drinking the water. But that was okay because I had a couple of scotches that took care of that <laughs> once I found out that I was a bus. But I mean, it's things like that. Uh, and, and you know, it's appalling. Some of the systems in Wisconsin go back to 1880. You know, and where's the, where's the constitutional uh, correctness of that? But we need to do uh, the education on the old job among each other. And trust is a big thing in the alliance. I know if I'm not down here, they uh, merely will and the people who lose the other will damn the job. People in Mississippi are doing a good job. That's the feeling I have. The people leave in Colorado, which is westernmost. I'll leave you with this, the way I look at uh, my task. It's an Appalachia sunrise and a Rocky Mountain sunset. It's Sojourner's Truth, Engine Joe's Cave, Chief Washington's Revenge, that's the Wind River. If you've ever been up in Wyoming and got on the Wind River, you'd be in love forever. It's Pompey's Pillow, that's where Lewis named Sacagawea's baby, and a rock as you roll across the high lights. John Steinbeck, John Steinbeck's way. Willow Cats, your Falkland's dreams in our realm. Thank you.
statistics and quite security and things like that. They laugh because we bought into the game. And it's a health issue. It's simple. It's women, pardon me, it's children, women, and family, and public health problems. Nothing more than that. It's simple. It's for your stuff. More girl question. <laughs> Yes, the historic aspect of when the original old people came here, the original old people, because people had a bad immigration policy, that's what led people to come here, and the entire idea of dominion. The first person off the boat was a priest, or they claimed. So therefore, we've given up sovereignty. When you put this, uh, Thank you. 